Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our Awakening and Wondering What the F is Going On podcast. If you don't know what WTF means, go and Google it, you'll find out. But I am Rosie Glow, and I'm the channel of Divine Grace, which means awakening to the power of revelation, which allows things to shift in an instant as suddenly you see something you couldn't see before. And I have the wonderful Dan Elliott with me today, who I'm so excited to be speaking with. We've literally just had a 40 minute chat ahead of this podcast to kind of work out what exactly we want to share. But I want to firstly introduce him and then in his own words, he'll let you know. And we've got a few key topics we really want to cover today. And I'm sure this is just part one of many um, connections because you're a phenomenal man and I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, so Dan and I first acquainted through uh, the Yoga Centre about balance, which is where I was teaching and he was also teaching, but I, I didn't really become aware of him because we'd never met until he started commenting on some of my posts at the start of this whole hoo-ha pandemic, whatever we want to call it, and, and I got interested in what he was doing, started to look at his posts and I was like, wow, this man is so switched on. So Dan, like a few little key pointers with you, I mean... You're a real advocate of what I would call the divine masculine. Um, you are championing taking action at a time when so many people just want to keep their blinkers on. Um, I, I'm fascinated with you because you're ultimately, you know, in the world of the holistic and the alternative, but you're also in the mainstream, but, and you have experience in education and social work and working with the authorities or the establishment, as it were. What is, when we actually think about getting together and having this conversation, I wanted to chart your awakening journey. What, what kind of got you from like just doing what we do to then starting to question it and, and actually ask why are we doing this and what is the alternative? So do you want to step yeah. in and just... Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I think that probably you can look at it from two angles. I think there's a more spiritual side to it that has taken me a little bit longer to understand. And there was a very practical day-to-day awakening that was happening with me and that started very quickly so up until this era whatever we want to call it the C um, era. <laughs> yeah the C era I um didn't take a massive interest in what was going on around the world I'd never read a newspaper um, 46 years old never read a newspaper not because I didn't want to be duped and I didn't believe the lies but because actually I didn't want to be disturbed, mentally disturbed by what was going on around the world. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I heard news stories about famines and massacres and things going on far further afield. And I chose actively not to engage with that because for me, dealing with my own day-to-day -day life, my own family, my own friends, my own issues was enough. Um, mm -hmm. And I just needed to manage to get through. So I'd done that for 46 years. And then when this kicked off back in 20, well, the start of 2020 for us really, um instantly it felt wrong I, I got that feeling that something wasn't right and um I tried to kind of tentatively raise that with a few close friends um, and relatives and you know on the socially distanced walks around the downs and saying I'm, I'm not feeling this there's something something's off here do you not feel this I think there's something going on globally that we need to be aware of and each of those conversations was kind of clipped, closed down, and I was reassured that I was overreacting and just panicking for no reason. Um, and so I ended up writing to myself. So within about three weeks of this kicking off, I wrote a letter to myself and said, I'm really scared about this. And I think they're going to be trying to control this. And I think they're going to be trying to jab everyone. And this was before any of this was, was discussed. And um, put that to one side. And then it was kind of stories I was seeing on social media that really resonated with me and I don't know why I don't have any old people in an old person's home I have no elderly relatives being cared for in that way but I saw some footage of um, an old person in a home that was not being allowed to see her family she was crying I then saw clips of somebody trying to remove their opposite and it made me feel physically sick um, that we were suddenly living in a society that was allowing this to happen and seeing this as necessary and normal um, and I couldn't stomach this. And I thought, I need to find out more. And then as I started to watch my, sorry, pet seagulls. Um, as I started to watch, they've come for their food. So they are literally my pet seagulls. So I'm sorry, okay. they'll, they'll probably scream. So, but, you only feed them. <laughs> they're constantly being fed. Um, and um, so um, 
yeah, I, I started to observe how my friends and family were reacting to what we were being told we had to do. And that then left me really disturbed because I thought, if my father, for example, is willing, easily willing to stop seeing his grandchildren at the drop of a hat because he's told it's necessary, that worried me because I thought, well, he, would he do the same for me? Because if he were in a home and somebody was keeping him there and I wasn't able to get to him, I'd walk through a burning building to get him out. I'd do the same for my children. And I was gobsmacked to watch the majority of the people I knew just going along with this and accepting that we had to be starved of human contact and expression. That was obviously all then followed by the censorship and the propaganda. And once you started to see one thing, you become aware of everything and um, none of it sits well with you. And you start to realize that um, something is very off. In terms of kind of a spiritual awakening, I realized that something switched on in me um, that left me sitting there very uncomfortable with the way I was living, the way I was accepting what I was being told, what I had believed to be true, who I was trusting. And I didn't suddenly wake up one morning and think, oh, now I've got it, I understand what's going on with me. I woke up one morning and thought, I feel ill, I feel anxious, I feel depressed. I'm, I'm listening to that person talk who I've known for years and I'm thinking, this isn't, we've not got the same relationship. I'm not seeing you in the same way. So everything fell out of place. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a really interesting experience because it sent me into a real panic. And I thought, am I, am I mentally ill? Am I suffering some kind of breakdown or depression here? Um, and I navigated that calmly. I mean, as like yourself, you know, I've got a certain um, toolkit uh, of skills that you learn through teaching or through yoga or through meditating that um, sustained me in isolation because I didn't have anybody else to, to go to about those things. And um, gradually began to gain my strength and think, no, actually, I am OK with my beliefs. I believe what my instincts are telling me. Contrary to what felt like the entire world telling me something different, I actually am safe in my beliefs and I, I, I am right. Um, you beautifully describe, I just want to come in there, this point of awakening that is the breakdown before the breakthrough, right? Which is when actually the reason I see that so many people just won't even go there. I mean, we talk about cognitive dissonance is because yeah. they're terrified. The whole fabric of the life that we've been told is the way things are goes, goes to question, right? It's like suddenly none of that is real. It's the Truman yeah. show. It's all of the stuff we've watched on TV, right? And we go through an existential crisis because our ego, our sense of identity is totally threatened if none yeah. of that stuff is true. And you know, we're going to go into the ego in a bit and the divine masculine, but you're, you know, what I'm hearing you say is you made the journey from your head to your heart. It's yeah. like you, you basically realized that if you just unplugged from everyone else and what they were saying, what, what was in here was saying, I'm not wrong. Yeah. And this, we have a little mis misunderstanding about the ego. We're all like desperate to get rid of our ego, but we have to remember our ego is our survival programming and there is a time it has to kick in. And that's, <coughs> We are properly being threatened. Our lives are being threatened. So that that sort of sense of identity has to be re-examined. Who am I in this? And, yeah. you, you know, part of the reason I'm such a fan is like, I know you, you will step forward and we have a similar energy where we'll, we'll support yeah. the underdog and we're there. Like, like you know, we, we have that sense of responsibility, which we, we can go into all sorts of detail. Yeah. What might be the shadow of that doesn't really matter. We're here as, as awakeners, right? So you got your awakening downloads. Yeah. And had to then look at the fact that actually, and it is one of the saddest things, it feels sad, and I've seen it happen with my husband as well, when you realise you've had this group of friends, you've had this sense of, this is my tribe, and then you look at it again and go, no, this isn't my tribe, it's not based on death. Yeah. And it was so, never what I thought it was. And so in a sense, your friendships, your tribes, were no different to the news or... Um, the world of medicine or industry or commerce, all of those things that we've trusted and listened to without question. We've done that with our friendship groups and our families. You know, we have a sentimental attachment, we have an identity or a way of life we've carved out. And so when you reach that point where you step out of it and look at it and think, is it serving a purpose? Is it authentic? Is it actually 
um, taking us all further and allowing us all to grow. Can I show up to that group and be me? Mm -hmm. Or do I have to be a version of me that suits the narrative? And I suppose, you know, it took me a long time to get there, but to get to the age of 46 and realize I need to show up as me. Mm -hmm. And if that's not acceptable, well, then I just don't show up there. I show up by myself or I surround myself with other people who resonate um, on the same frequency. And that's, and that's what we were sort of talking about sovereignty and what it means to be free. And, you know, I see you as an embodiment of the divine masculine because I see you owning your truth, being prepared to stand like a staff in the ground. And if people don't like it, they step away. You're not trying to make everybody like you and agree with you and force your opinions on them. You're just saying, this is where I stand. Do you resonate? Do you not willing to let people go that don't? Also, you're in the world you know, sufficiently in the world of the establishment to know what's wrong with it and to know that even if it's well-meaning ignorance, for example, which is one potential, and then there's also nefarious intent on another level as well, um, and just chaos is another thing in between, you are aware of what would need to shift within the structures to allow us to, to move beyond. But there's a you know, I would love you to share a little bit about what you do. And also, you know, I want to, you're gay, you're a gay guy who's got two kids, right? That I've just, you know, found out about. And I was, I was nosing around as to how that's all happened. But you have the interest as, you know, a father as well, right? And it's like, how are you navigating this now in these situations? So let's go there in a sec. Just tell us a little bit about your professional background and, you know, how you're standing now in this sovereignty with everything you do. Yeah, well, I was probably always moving towards it. So as a, uh, my background has always been in education. So I was um, a secondary teacher of languages, um, moved into primary teaching. So assisting primary teachers to teach languages when they were told by the government that languages needed to be in primary schools. And have subsequently, I then became a language advisor for a London local authority and moved out of that into being a consultant. So I still train primary teachers or trainee teachers. Um, as a consultant. Um, aside from that, I work in social work. So I work for a social work agency with independent social workers who carry out assessments on families. And I teach yoga and I'm a masseur and I teach French and Italian private lessons. So there's always been an element of teaching there, but obviously my, my work has brought me into close contact, the thick of local authorities, education, internal school structures, working with social workers, working with the police, all of those have played quite an active role. And, you know, going through that, it always felt that I was doing something that was useful and that was right. Um, but of course you enter those professions as a trainee or as a novice and you, are, you do what you're told to do. And it's only if you've got some inner strength that you start to find who you are in that position. What kind of teacher am I? Am I a teacher that was told to do this because that's how we were told it's the right way? well we're supposed to teach children like this now oh okay sorry I've been getting it wrong for all these years mm -hmm. and I've never followed those fads I've always gone in and, and tried to teach instinctively mm -hmm. um, and so far touch wood that's you know that's always worked well. Um, well this, is, this is what we were saying about education the fact that we're, we're a similar age and I, I was talking about when the structures came in to play where the way that you know progress is monitored in schools and it became all about admin teachers suddenly were having to do all this admin and we were discussing pedagogy versus indoctrination and the fact that our school system and in england it's really quite creative in comparison like i've i've been to school in singapore i've been to school in greece i've been to school in australia you know i've been to school in, in england and there is a difference right in terms of the different types whether it's private um international independent uh, state school and which country you're in but it's all you know We've always had a little bit more leeway here until about, yeah, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And it, it's become something that in Greece, they talk about you learn parrot fashion. You just learn, you repeat back. And this is a form of brainwashing, right? I mean, it's fine with your times table, but to just say that life is this way is crazy. Yeah. And I remember my daughter had to go to, well, she went through a really tough time in her teens and she got pulled out of school for a little bit. We took her out and home educated her. And I remember going down to the library to pick up like key stage two or key stage three science and maths books, like to buy her so she could do her exams. And I just remember looking in the science bit and I decided to look up immunizations. And I could not buy this book. I could not buy it because it said 
immunizations are responsible for getting rid of all of these um, illnesses around the world. They work, the benefits outweigh the risks. And I'm like, holy fuck. A 14 year old reads this, and this is a fact. Yeah. This is a fact that is never challenged. How many other things are not challenged? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, teachers now, if we're just talking about that profession, teachers are shoehorned into teaching in a way that perhaps does not feel instinctive. Uh, perhaps we're at the stage now where teachers haven't got even the space to find a way to teach instinctively because they're they're following by rote what they have to do when they have to report by what the children have to have jumped through in terms of hoops and learning goals and attainment by certain points and gradually all of that eats away at the learning experience which is we're supposed to be giving children this wonderful rich experience of um, so many different things so that ultimately that child can navigate themselves learn how to learn and find themselves and choose what kind of life they want at the end of it mm -hmm. as opposed to what it feels like now which is whether it's global or whether it's national they are dictating how this happens to our children what experience they're going to get what the diet is because we want them to come out like this at the end of it yeah. um, that's you know largely the reason I came out of mainstream teaching in a classroom was because I realise I'm fighting a system here that it, that is I'm within a system that doesn't work for me. Yeah, and let's let's really recap on that because we're talking about the difference between giving someone the foundations to love learning, to be able to apply learning how to learn to anything, right? Whether it's a language, whether it's science, whether it's rollerblading, whatever, right? Yeah. Versus a an agendered curriculum with a specific intention to get people thinking a certain way, believing certain things. And that's what I would call indoctrination, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, if we apply this to what's going on in the world today, you know, one of the things we were saying is for years, both you and I weren't too bothered about the fact that, you know, there's a mainstream approach to health and, you know, the GP says this, but your nutritionist or holistic therapist will say this it's just you know they're catching up they're catching up they're not quite there yet they mean well but they're catching up yeah, yeah, yeah. in a way that there's been this whole gene determinism thing going on forever that they're still buying into when there's all this new science around epigenetics that's not that friggin new 1969 oh it's not that new right so it still hasn't made it into science it hasn't made it into even our medical system in a way that you'd think it should in my opinion, it's been 50 years, you know, not longer if I can count. And we're now in a place where we can see something we weren't concerned about so much and just accepted it was just one of the foibles of life to actually going, holy Moses, there's like no room for anything other than this. Yeah. That's questionable. Very yeah. questionable. But it also brings with it a massive sense of betrayal, I think. So... Um, for those of us who perhaps have stepped outside of that now and see it as it is, it's like we've taken a veil away, we've taken the shadow of it, and we can see what was done to us, not necessarily with bad intentions by the teachers that we worked with or the doctors that we came into contact with or our parents or whatever. They did what they believed was best because we've always trusted who told us what was best. Mm -hmm. So you go through that process and it's now it, there is that sense of bereavement again when you look at all of these things and you think, I've bought into this. Now I've got to start from scratch. I've got to step out and question everything. And that's bloody hard work. It's a pain in the ass to look at everything and start questioning it. What am I putting in my body? Oh, I'm putting that in because somebody told me I should. Oh, yeah. I eat that because somebody told me it was healthy. Now I've just heard it might not be. Yeah. There's an overwhelm of information. What am I putting on my skin? What am I using in my house? What am I spending my money on? Where am I going? What am I engaging in? All of those things suddenly start to come apart of the scenes and now that can be really scary for people who are as we like to say awakening is it, you talk about this it's like the establishment how often do you hear follow the science with you know this is an established way of seeing things i'm like well who is the establishment yes we're in that place we're going who are they and why are they the establishment i think you did a post about the fact that it was you i'm not sure if it was you it might have been that there was like the only reason the establishment is the establishment is because they bullied their way into being the establishment and got rid of everyone else it's like the king tribe right yeah. and now we're all the minions billions of us compared to them yeah still being controlled and we're now going well hold on a minute yeah let's subscribe to that 
Yeah. Quickly, I mean, someone did a post the other day, which really made me laugh. It's like, you know, we weren't allowed, once upon a time, we weren't allowed to go into a club if we were taking experimental drugs in there with us. Now, you can't get into a club without taking an experimental drug. In <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it, but it's, it's easy, see, it's easy for us, I say it's easy, it's not, but it's easier for us to, to notice the incongruent messages we're being given and the stuff that doesn't make sense. But until you step out of that, until you, I don't know, get automatically given a download, or unless you fight and go to the you. Weekend, you know, who knows how that happens. And we've spent most of the last 18 months trying to awaken people, trying to say to people, why can't you see this? And it's a point of frustration and we're sort of putting this frustration on people. I still don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether it's because they are meant to be where they are. They're meant to go through this journey of very slow awakening or no awakening or awakening and feeling incredible guilt or a lack of self-respect or some disappointment in themselves. Or um, we're all on, on this journey, but for us, we can look at it now and see this is a group, an elite that feeds into everything that we do. And when you say to all of those others, the plebs, the rest of us, this is all wrong and you're just going along with it. That's too big an ask. Um, so all we can do is to hold our strength. We're ourselves. We share what we can share. We give our authentic messages and we get it wrong sometimes. But we're learning how to get it wrong and stand up again and say, oh, OK, sorry. That post I, I, I shared contained too much ego or I was angry or had some um, information that wasn't factual. I didn't realise yeah that's okay we can we're going in the right direction to try to get it right and to try to take responsibility and sovereignty over what we're doing yeah you're talking about accountability and transparency which if we <coughs> had that in the media if we had it in our governments we'd have a lot more trust but we don't we get told this like you see the headlines change all the time I and mean, the promises that have been made that have not been delivered on if a parent was doing this to their child it would be considered abusive abuse absolutely how many times do you dangle a carrot and then take it away and then punish them and tell them they're the reason they're yeah. not getting it? That's yeah. what goes on. And we keep hanging. I mean, I remember seeing a headline in the mirror. When will we be free? What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who are you asking? Yeah. You know, so let's take this to the divine masculine and the wounded masculine because yeah. we're all in a patriarchal system at the moment, right? This is the system that's coming down. Now, the patriarchy is not... The divine masculine this is the wounded masculine element that's in all of us regardless yeah. of our gender right it doesn't matter what our gender is it matters that we have in us an aspect that wants to control and dominate in order to feel safe mm -hmm. but I argue that the the wounded feminine is judgmental and anxious and critical you know in a way that undermines all the time right so there's some key elements here in terms of wounded in a child, whiny, whingy, never getting them meet, you know, they met, all of that stuff, right? These are, we just have to look at these elements very lovingly because they're in all of us and they show up at different times. And that's when we know we need to give that some attention. So the, the wounded masculine, as I perceive it, not wanting to offend anyone, is the men that are walking around with the masks on, doing what they're told, telling their children they should do what they're told, telling their wives they should do what they're told. Just, just follow the science, just follow the rules, and we can all get out of this as quickly as possible. Totally emasculated. You know, where are our balls? What does it mean to have balls? You know, like all ovaries or breasts or whatever. Yeah. Being on this journey where there are men that are standing up now and saying this is wrong, it does not feel right, under even the principles of democracy or human rights, I cannot condone this, this is not right for my child, this is not right for our society, I will stand, I will speak, I will deal with persecution, I will deal with attack, and we can talk about this, but I don't think you or my jobs are at risk here, right? But for the people that have got to decide whether they're going to leave their job or they're going to get the thing or that, you know, I don't want to disrespect anyone in the sense of the decisions we're all having to make. However, yeah. you are an embodiment of a divine masculine. You have got children. You are in a situation where, you know, you're not in the same perspective as the mother of the children, but you're finding the way around it all. What do you want to say about this? I think it's, it's interesting. So this idea of being a wounded male, I think, um, Again, we've been trained to be that, that wounded masculine, which shows his strength. 
through uh, aggression or crit uh, criticizing others or I'm standing up for this, I'm getting into a verbal row, all of those things that are driven very much by an ego that isn't helpful, mm. as opposed to um, what I perceive to be my strength, which is um, I need to bring myself up to the, the plate here. I need to stand up for what I think is right. I need to do it with courage. I need to bring in those elements of compassion and um, forgiveness. Um, I also need to recognize my weaknesses and those. So when I see that ego coming in, and as you say, the ego has a place, it's, it, it defends me, it keeps me safe. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it pushes me over a line and I think that I'm not proud of the way that I've reacted there. I need to step back. And so cultivating that masculine strength is, is crucial. And I've never had really an opportunity to do that alongside so many other men doing the same thing. And that's really exciting to see the difference between these men, all of the other men that you and I will encounter through our work or through, through the marches or through these kind of connections that we have in our networks. Seeing these men who are fired up into acting I am going to step forth. I will suffer the consequences, but I need to do this for the good of others. And that is something you have no control of. It, it, it comes out in you if it's there. I'd love to see it awaken in a lot more men because it is astonishing to me to see men who have kind of lost that and never been trained in it or it's not coming out naturally yet. Fingers crossed at some point it will. But whether or not having had children impacted on that, I don't know because Certainly having had my kids, they're five now, um, I feel a greater weight of responsibility. I feel greater fear because I'm scared. I can suffer stuff that happens to me. That's kind of acceptable. I feel a great fear for what might come for their futures or I'm saying futures, I mean, it's here now. Mm. Um, and I need to step in, someone has to step in. And that I have perceived as my role. Now, had I not had them, I suspect I would still have been feeling this urge to step forth. And it was a very scary thing to do at the start. So I remember um, daring to voice a couple of things on social media. I'm a bit concerned about this. Is nobody else? And getting shot down in flames each time I did it. And when that happened, I recoiled. I shut my mouth for a few days and I thought, don't say anything because this is embarrassing. So your fear, your fear is what other people are made, they're judging you as. And it was actually a, a friend who said to me, Dan, this is really valuable what you're doing. You need to keep doing it. Mm. A few private messages from people saying, thank you so much, Dan, because I, I wanted to say it, but I didn't dare. Mm -hmm. Now that gave me more courage because I thought there are people here, quiet, behind the scenes who, who need me to do this. There's mm -hmm. a purpose here that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you build an armour. And so then I thought I can venture forth, I can post something, I could say something and I can get it wrong. Mm. And I can suffer the consequences because somebody can come back and ridicule me, insult me, uh, misinform me, whatever it might be. I'm okay to bounce back. You. you kind of learn your resilience, which I didn't have perhaps before. Perhaps I did, but I hadn't ever put it to the test. So you become stronger and each time you go back in, you think this is okay, I can suffer that. I can suffer the risk of physical harm I've suffered the loss of most of my friends and family in the way that I knew them previously so there's all that bereavement the, the upheaval but you are gaining constantly in strength and the, and the, that strength is fine on its own I'm I am okay on my own if I had to be single no children losing all my friends and family I know I would be absolutely fine but I also recognize that I get so much joy and strength from making connections with people like yourself who uh, give me that space to be me to love me for what I bring to that party to question me honestly if I get something wrong um, there is an unconditional acceptance that perhaps has never existed in any of the other relationships um, mm. and so as a as a masculine figure, is it because I'm, I'm, I'm male? I don't know. Is it because I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, masculine necessarily in the conventional sense of the word, but you're there, masculine, mate. You're all <laughs> masculine. there is something that I need to um, and, um, you know, and it's been a, a pleasure and honor, a privilege to be able to do that. Um, but it's the responsibility as well. And I think yeah. that there's a lot of people that will suffer the weight of not having risen up to that responsibility at a later stage it's like yeah it's that how do i put this i think that you know 
is i'm being a bit crude but it is the dropping of the balls it is like when we you know we kind of really go actually what does it mean to man up woman up what does it mean to claim my power fully right what does it mean to go sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me what does it mean when you actually you know i've seen this a couple of people have seen on social media they've lost their partners recently they're like i've got nothing to lose anymore i don't even want to be here so i'm going in and that's what i don't think the i love this the deletes have realized this is from jen love it the deletes not the elite what they don't think they realize is that people are really willing to die for this you know they it's like i would rather fight to my death than actually lie down and take this because what i see and you know i can i will always compare it to the birthing world because for me when i was working with a woman in pregnancy yoga and I can hear she's just buying all of the rhetoric that's coming from the maternity services. She's likely to go in, be induced. I can predict how her labor's going to go. It's like the way I used to describe it, lambs to the slaughter is not right. It's not fair, but it's like conveyor belt, right? You just know what's going to happen. Yeah. Whereas those who claim their power while they're pregnant, they go through what you did, this sense of, oh my goodness, I feel betrayed by the people that are supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to be feeling safe because of you. I'm in a vulnerable state and you're telling me things that aren't true, but you're telling me that that's the only way and that's what I must do. And the language you're using implies I have no choice unless I go and I find out I've got loads of choices. And actually none of that is true if I put it this way. And, oh my God, I've now got to make decisions for my little one. And I'm going to be making decisions that the authorities tell me are the wrong decisions but I am the only person who really cares about this kid, like not to the point that I'm scared I'm going to be sued, but that I actually want this child to be healthy and vibrant and well all their lives. And therefore, how many other mothers and fathers around me are doing the research? I am. They're not. Therefore, they don't know as much as I do. And then when I go and I speak to the pediatrician or the obstetrician or the midwife or the health visitor and I go, well, have you seen this and this and this and this? And they go, no. And I'm like, so what? You want me to do what you're telling me, but you don't know any of this. Yeah. No, mate. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. And that is that is the journey that you are describing of being sovereign. Yeah. It's that, that it is that strength coming into you that um that enables you. And that, that happens to, as you say, a lot of women, and it happened to my children's mum, you know, certainly around childbirth, you know, giving birth naturally to twins, where all of the experts were steering her away from that because no we need you to take these drugs or we need you to have a c-section because there's a higher risk of x y and z and something inside her was saying no this is how i want to do it this is what my children need and so mm -hmm. stepping into that power is incredible and so what we have we may be fewer in numbers in terms of those who are questioning what's going on or actively fighting against it but we're an incredibly strong um, intuitive population Mm. And that to me is wonderful because, as you say, we would die for what we are trying to achieve. Um, there is nothing to lose. Mm. There is no value in me sticking around and surrounding myself by friends who don't want to see the real me. That's not what I want. There's no value in me leading a life that is dictated by this government. There's, that's not my life. There's no value in me believing everything that a lying media will tell me then I'm living a lie. So if all of that just falls apart, what have you got to live for if you are signing up for all of that? So the other option is you step away. So no, I don't want that. I want something better. And if it's a choice between that and fighting to the death, will you fight to the death? Um, no we, know, we, know, we know death isn't possible because we're caught. Uh, exactly. Exactly. There is there's nothing, you know, people are terrified about that. This entire era, the C era, is, is around dying fear of dying fear of this illness fear of something going wrong with the body and you can't breathe and this painful death and um, once you realize that actually death is one of the the last things you need to be afraid of mm. loss is painful yeah absolutely grief bereavement is painful but me dying is not something that that terrifies me it will happen it's the only thing i know is gonna <laughs> definitely happen you but know I'm what, like, I, I was always terrified of dying, even as a child. And it's one of my thoughts, as a four-year-old, I was terrified of death. It was a being nothing. It was a being nothing. It wasn't about death. It was a ceasing to exist. I couldn't understand how I could exist in here and then not. But I want to take this back to what you said right at the start, which was about the nursing homes and the fact that we're, we've all been programmed 
to be pressured into the greater good. It's not the highest good, the greater good. We've got to put other people first. And the irony is when you look at the factions of service to self, service to others, it's the service to self agenda that's saying put others first, ironically. Everything's back to front. The villains are not the villains. The goodies are not the goodies. We're all like, what do we do with this in terms of what's illusion and what is real? And you know, you're talking here about authorities telling us that our elderly relatives shouldn't see us because they might get sick and die. And then it's like, hold on a minute. They're really old and they're not very well, or maybe they are, but they need more contact. What do we want? We want to keep them alive and isolate for as long as possible. For At any cost, yeah. For what? For what? Why? And yeah. we're also being told on the one hand that we have an overpopulated planet, but we need this thing, this prick, I'm going to call it a prick, to <laughs> everyone. It's just like, okay, so what yeah. do we live now? But do we want not everyone to live now? And you, yeah. I know that there's a lot of conversation around what's going on in Africa and how these jabs are experimented on. And then we're talking about medical apartheid and we're talking about, you know, is it possible to put agents in these things that will mean that procreation is a challenge? You know, is it, we just, there's so many questions, but we're not living on a, a it's not a level playing field because the level of censorship, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, you know, I, I can't share what you share on Facebook anymore. I just can't. I, I'm, I see how I've been dropped. I can always, all I can do is family pics, basically, if I dare do anything else. And it's like, yeah, yeah. It's easy. Yeah. And you kind of, I feel like at this stage, if we're in this process where we're supporting each other to feel confident to awaken, like if we bring this here and say, it's not easy to accept that things are not the way we've been taught, but it is the most liberating thing you can do because once you do, you'll find that inner authority. Yeah. We've talked a lot about compassion and, you know, for me, qualities of compassion include discernment, forgiveness, transparency, accountability, honesty, um, mercy. Dis I think I've said discernment, but there's, there's several, you know, and, and the, it then brings this other question up that I wanted to ask you about, which is when do we, you know, I, for a long time, I've not wanted to accept that fighting is essential or that we are in some kind of war. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you've got to call a spade a spade, you know? Like, we are defending. We are not instigating an attack. But if you think in terms of martial arts, you have to defend yourself against the attack, otherwise you're dead, right? So in your own experience, knowing when to step forward, when to back off, what what would you say on all of that because yeah so i guess still learning is the answer is the full answer to that i'm still learning when is the right um time to step forward and that's been a, a year-long tussle in my mind a fight i mean it's not the word itself instinctively conjures up something that's negative doesn't it i'm going to fight um but actually um do i believe we should proactively fight, be fighting i kind of do I think we, we all have roles and I think that some people maybe will instinctively feel that their role is not to do that, but it's there to support others or to be there for them when they go through the grieving process and the massive realisations that they've already, other people have gone through. Um, for me, it feels that I cannot stay quiet if I see injustice. I cannot watch something go out to the public that is a lie without countering it in some way, shape or form. So yes, as you say, it's a bit of a reaction. But that doesn't mean that everything that I do, everything I write, um, all of the actions I take are just reactions because my brain is constantly alert all day, every day, too much, trying to think, what do I need to do next? I need to make a difference. We are at war. We are trying not to return to the old normal, not to accept their new normal, but to allow us as humans to go on a journey towards what is right for us, um, whatever that might be, whatever elements of the past we might want to take forward, whatever new things we want to create, that's our right to decide. It's our responsibility to decide that. And so what we're seeing is then trying to take that away from us, that right to decide. We've never really had it, which is realising it en masse now. 
So we're stepping in and saying, hold on, stop, stop the clock. We're taking back that power. You're not stealing it from us. and We're not going to live with whatever. I mean, every day we get a new decision, a new law, a new plan, something revealed. And, you know, it's a, it is an attack on our senses, on our stability. So, yeah, you know, yeah absolutely. I feel I have um, a need to come in and to navigate that carefully. So on a one to one basis, every day is pitted with these interactions with people where I'm having to be very careful and think, OK, this person perhaps isn't ready to hear this. Or if I'm saying this without realising I'm actually really insulting that person. Mm -hmm. um or stuff it you're going to take what i'm throwing out there because i need to just own it and put it out there and you deal with the consequences of the feelings that it drops on you um so every day i think we're navigating that perhaps getting better at it finding out what our role is trying to carve our role out um in that coming together as a collective with an immense strength and it's not physical strength it's um internal emotional mm -hmm. spiritual strength um that just grows when we are together, when we're making these connections. Um, mm. You know, so yeah, I think that there is a there is a role for fighting, there is a role for being proactive, um, for refusing, for saying, no, I am not accepting your authority over me. I will dig my heels in. And it's all well and good to say we just need to be, be patient, send out love, and wait for things to go right. But if I'm sitting here doing that this very minute. And the person next to me is being walloped over the head by a truncheon. I could sit here and say, okay, the right thing is happening to that person for whatever reason. I don't understand it. And that might be the case. But I know that something inside me will say, no, I sod the peaceful moment. I need to step in here and save that person and stop this atrocity. You're, you are talking a beautiful dance here between, you know, the discernment that comes with consciousness, right? Because... You know, I would say I'm busy co-creating a new earth and this whole point of, you know, awakening and wondering, you know, what the fuck and the star seed narrative that I want to, you know, create. Like for me, it's like, let's take every horror story and turn it into a beautiful story that we want to live out. And I met someone randomly yesterday who told me that this is called solar fiction and it's completely new to me, like a creative writer in my local area who knows all about it. I was like, right, perfect. So I'm, I consider myself someone who is stabilizing in 5D frequency, busy building the new earth. But then there are lots of people that are very, they've got that warrior energy, which, for, you know, I've, ha I've evolved through. It's not, it's not the best use of my energy because of how sensitive I am. So I'm doing something else. But there are lots of people here that are bringing down the old world and building the bridge. We're all building the bridge between the two. And yeah. it's difficult to conceive the idea, you know, like, I believe we can have peace on earth. I know I can see how we can create it, actually. And it all goes to fertility, conception, birth. I, I don't see why this planet has to be at war anymore. I feel we can, you know, evolve beyond it. And that is our choice now. And all of us in the woo-woo world get the message, the light has already won. It's just taking some time to filter. And as you say, you can't just sit there and go, um... Well, there's an atrocity happening right next to you and not confront it right it's in your backyard but you are standing forward in ways that i have so much respect for because you are i'd love you just to share all the things you're involved with in terms of stand up in the park and the other things in the local area if men and women and anyone that is getting that sense of i want to actually stand up now they can come find you and get connected and we can grow our tribe yeah, so I mean, I guess Stand in the Park was the first um, organised network that I got involved with. Um, and for those who, I mean, you probably all do know what it is, but for those who don't, it is, um, it originated in Australia every Sunday, 10 o'clock start till 11, although they often run over if you want to stick behind. Just a place for people to go to meet where we weren't supposed to be meeting anybody. Um, uh, and it's usually a park, ours is actually on the beach in Brighton. And um we just meet with like-minded people and sometimes it's two people in certain groups around the world because it's gone global and um, sometimes it's 40 um they're not there to fight they're not there to protest they're there to be with like-minded souls and share ideas share concerns give support to people who maybe are at home alone weren't allowed to go out didn't have any family visiting because they weren't allowed to so needed some contact and that was fantastic because that gave me some networks to start working with and, and some friendships that have been really really nurturing um 
and from there obviously working with other groups we've got um, the freedom network and as part of that i work with um, an education hub so a group of parents who either were already home educating their children or are seriously considering taking their children out of mainstream school because they're scared of what might be happening or they just now have realized they don't like the system it's not working for their child um, and so we're working together to look at ways to support each other with networks, home educating networks, places where children can go or smaller hubs, however that works. Um, in terms of uh, growing fruit and veg and things like that, I have no idea. I kill everything that I try to grow in my garden and every year I have to try to replace it. Uh, but I've always wished I could. And we live on a, on a street where we're all in good communication with one another. And we have a WhatsApp group and I thought, um, I'll get in touch with everyone and see if we want to do a bit of a street project so that those who already grow or are gardeners or landscape gardeners or have an allotment can give us some advice and the rest of us can say I want to grow this 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 I am interested in this and so we can start to share um, something that brings us together now the rest of my street might not be aware of everything else that I'm involved in all my views but what they are doing practically is getting involved we're raising our energy as a street we're collaborating, we're looking out for each other. So all of these little things to me are really crucial to be involved in. Um, and then obviously my daily rants or sharings on social media that I kind of sometimes take a break from, I step back and I think, okay, I can't keep going at this pace. It's making me angry and it's unsettling me. I need to recenter. Um, mm. And I think I, my presence there is crucial. And I know that I've got ex-students that I talk when they were, you know, kiddies getting in touch with me saying, I can't talk to my husband about this, um, sir. They still call me, sir, I can't talk to my husband about this. And I'm really lonely. My family are all getting at me. But when I read something you've written, it makes me feel strong. And I'm really glad someone's recognised what I think is going on. So there is always a place. We could be talking to a silent audience and it can be really disheartening sometimes. You know, you get two likes and a hungry face and you mm. think, okay, that was worth you it. Can't, you can't rely on the responses, actually. And this is such an important thing about not looking outward for validation because we're always giving our power to external. Bigger. Absolutely. When you're looking there and the first thing you check is how many smiley faces are, you, you realise I'm back into the ego. Either I put the message out there because I thought it was an important message. Full stop. I actually should never even need to go back to it again. Um, mm -hmm. Except there might be somebody then answering a question or sharing something that's really valuable that I think I could then reshare. But, um, you know, it's, it's dropping back into those old patterns and then noticing and thinking, no, OK, there is value in what I'm doing. I need to keep doing that. Keep myself in check. Go on this wonderful journey of noticing what masculine strength is coming out, what um, interplay is going on with my relationships past, current. Not kidding myself into thinking for one minute that all of these relationships, these new friends that we've made are going to be there forever and ever. And we're always going to see eye to eye and things we won't. Not kidding myself to think that we're going to overthrow this government, stick up a new government, and then we'll all be happy ever after. Because as we know, there is this tendency for the larger something gets, the more corruptible it becomes. Um, but what we will be more and more skilled at is spotting these things, creating structures that are more transparent, um, creating safer ways to call things out that are less aggressive, that are more reasonable. Uh, can I just challenge that? Because I'm not happy with the way that this is going or this is no longer working for me in this particular network or this group i need to come away from it don't take that as an offense i don't need to go away wounded i need to go somewhere else and we need to be able to learn how to navigate as humans in and amongst each other and with each other and alone in a way that we've never been allowed to do mm -hmm. you know that's a big ask but as i say we've got immense strength amongst our numbers um in terms of you know internal strength and i think we're bringing that to the table and it's giving a lot of other people the strength to work through this yeah i i'm just so i just love hearing you and you know this is what makes me feel so hopeful is the fact that actually there is a way through there is a bridge there's the ultimate intention we have and then there's us in our lifetime helping to build that and yeah. see how what we already have can become something much better. I think that's kind of where I go with this is I can, you know, my premenstrual days, I'm like, off with their heads, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then in my less premenstrual days, I'm like, well, 
whatever the original cause of this is, because, you know, we can also go back to the, the stories we've been told about it, whatever the original cause of this current state of suppression, this current state of public health, this current state of whatever, it's a way. Is there a better way? Let's, let's stop getting into right and wrong. Yeah. Out of either or. And this and more. Okay, now, how do we evolve this? What is the best of humanity? And yeah. humanitarianism, humans. Light, hue. You know, we are light bearers. And we are here to either buy into the story of being totally, like, how to put it? victims because yeah. that's the, that is the story is like we are victims the lack the capitalism and again like, i don't have a problem with a lot of things that people do i see things differently but the and that'll be other other podcasts that will go into different details but essentially i just don't want fear to be running my life either personally or in the collective and you know, the way I describe this is we have a global addiction to adrenaline, which starts from our time in the womb and our birth experience and how we're nurtured. What if we had a global addiction to oxytocin instead, to the love hormone? And mm -hmm. you know, you've described about, we had a little discussion about pedagogy and this whole idea of like how you, you, you teach by example, right? You create a situation where people are naturally learning because of their curiosity. They're not being force fed something. And the example yeah. you gave about, you know, inviting your, your, street to garden you know and to get involved in growing stuff there's a the guy i met yesterday is doing just that and he's local in peace haven so we're going to make a connection yeah. it is the idea that they might not agree on anything else but they're still getting back to nature to their earthing their hands are in the earth they're getting back to the natural rhythms rather than the man-made yeah. and isn't it amazing and i just want to bring this to a close here that here we are it doesn't matter whether there's fluoride in the water whether they're trying to mess with our pineal glands, whether GM food is the future, all the crap that is in our environment and in everything, and we're still holding this light. It's a bit like... Yes. You know, like, <laughs> Absolutely. You can awaken. You can. Yeah. But, well, I mean, I, I would say a massive thank you to, to you and to, to other people like you who pushed this message forward and... I know that it's not always easy and I know that you're up against being censored or having this taken away or people battling you. And as you say, you, you said it was premenstrual or not, whether you were kind of off with their heads or it with love and light. And I must be premenstrual a lot of the time then because, you know, yeah. I, we, we, we slip into these things and that's okay. That's where we're meant to be because we have people like you and, um, and hopefully me who, who can help to steer, navigate, get things wrong and then somebody else can take the rudder. We don't need somebody telling us they are going to lead us. They are going to be our leader. Um, and I even see that on our side of the fence, if I can simplify it like that, people on our side of the fence, there are a lot of us who still have that habit of looking up for a leader. Why can't all of these networks come together? We just need one network, we're safer in numbers. Who's gonna tell us what we need to do? Who's gonna bring this? And there's that, that kind of natural, is it natural, like learned tendency to look to somebody to answer for them. Looking out. Uh, yeah, and what we're trying to do is, is create a space where all of us together can learn not to look up, but to look in. Yeah. And so we've got some answers and I've got something I might be able to share with you in terms of finding an answer and ignore me if you wish and I'm okay, I'm not going to be wounded by it. I'll be strong about it. I've just had Grace drop in as you said that because actually part of this is the religious indoctrination that then led into the scientific indoctrination like people have once upon a time they were told believe what we tell you don't question it God exists you can't tell you don't know where he is or whatever but this is what he is this is what he'll do to you you know believe it or what go to hell and people didn't like that and they reacted against that. And then that establishment, which was religion, became science. And it was like, let's prove everything is right or wrong, black or white. And then we realized it's not like that because it's more stiff and influenced by the observer. And both of those have been look outward because they've been about sort of not being able to trust inside because that's been there. But when, we, when you say from out to in, you're actually talking about that inner authority, which is the divine spark, which is the God within us. It is the it is the essence of love within each of us that when we tap yeah. into, it yeah. brings us to a different network around us, a different field. We're not in yeah. the fear field, we're in the thrive field. 
And it's a different, you've got hive mind automatron. Everybody thinks collective same thoughts, which is what we talked about at the start. And then you have this collective consciousness where we're all individual sparks bringing, lending our bit. And yeah, rather than having a leader from the top, it's like, who's feeling inspired by this? Who's is, who's is this to, to run with? And there yeah. are people that, you know, if, if we actually said, all right, well, in order to move forward, we can't keep discounting, you know, I love all this. Oh, it's got to be a double blind, randomized control trial. Otherwise it doesn't exist. And yet so much of our medical profession is based, I think only 20% of the NICE guidelines are based on grade A evidence, right? Most yeah. of it is not. And, you know, I used to get so frustrated because I would go to these wonderful birth-like conferences that were laid on every year by my teacher, Francoise Friedman, and all the best birth professionals from around the world would come forward and basically tell you what is the current research that will become commonplace 20, 40 years from now? And you have that information and you're just like, I just want everyone to know this, but the hospital's going, oh no, we don't do that. So let's bring this to a close with a real sense of amazing things are happening. You know, amazing things are happening. What would you like to end with on the amazingness of what is happening right now that you want to celebrate? Gosh, I think that for me, it's that um, as an individual, I am growing in strength and that light inside me, whether you want to call it Mother Nature or God or Earth or instinct, intuition, whatever it is, there is something that is growing. And the beauty that I've seen in the last 18 months is that that is happening to billions of people across the planet for whatever reason. And I think it is for a reason we are on this journey and this awakening is happening where people are realizing their true potential and they're, they're cultivating it. This is, this is our training ground. We're growing this and we're learning about ourselves and we're improving our mechanisms and our um, resilience and tenacity and all of those things. And we're all doing that together. Um, and so for me, there is massive hope um, around us, within us, connected or on our own, um this will go the way it needs to go um we don't have to go along with what we don't want to go along with and we won't we aren't um so those moments of fear that we we feel listen to the fear that's fine we all we all are all afraid hear the fear observe it calm whatever you need to do to calm yourself down and then get ready to come back and join and fight um in whatever way you see fit to fight um, I know a very helpful way of seeing fighting, I think, is to recognize that in our, there's a, I think it's an, an old American Indian saying of there always being two wolves in the head, you know, one is the wolf of fear, one is the wolf of love, which one are you going to feed, you know, which one's going to win is the one that you feed the most, and that is the fight in each of us, yes, 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 yes. the narrative we want to energize rather than not. So for anyone who is really in terror, I have this amazing course called Fearless, Empowered and Free, oh, sorry, Fearless, Loved Up and Free, which is all about learning to live fearlessly in fear triggering times. Dan is like the master of just like going, coming back, going, coming back, feeling that passion, transmuting it, into, you know, the anger even and transmuting it into passion for change. I'm going to make sure everybody has your details if you're happy to share. So if they want to go to different groups. And we will have another conversation because there's just so many to have. But I'm so grateful to you for today. Thank well, you. what a pleasure. What a privilege. Thank you so much for, um, for the chance to prattle and, um, and, and speak to you soon. Definitely. Um, big love to everybody. Big love. Take care. Make love. Make love. <laughs>